you know, I'm going to answer the question, which is, why demography? Why am I a demographer? I mean, I, mean, I have two planning degrees, and yet all my work is in policy of, you know, immigration or housing policy, urban policy. But why demography? And, you know, I'm going to answer the question in a way I've never actually done in public before. It's all because of Paul Davidoff. My first job was working with Paul Davidoff, and he got me working with the census data to look at the changes going on in the suburbs of New York City and try to study the growing income inequality that was shaping up in the region back using the 1970 census. That's all we had back then. Uh, and I, you know, that's where I, I first learned the power of what could happen. Later I discovered how much smarter demographers were than economists. And so then I wanted to really look in more closely. Why are they smarter? Well, Tritter already alluded to it. That, that eco economics is really the most important science. It really is extremely important to everybody. And yet, economists can't predict ahead of time what interest rates will be in three months, or the stock market tomorrow, or anything important like that. Whereas demographers know that in 10 years' time, everybody in this room is going to be 10 years older. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but what does that mean? Well, it means a lot, because if you're a 15-year-old, you're living with your parents. And if you're 25 years old, you're a millennial, you're still living with your parents. <laughs> Or are you? So that's part of the subject for today's talk. Uh, we really don't know uh, the future in detail, but we know some facts about it which are pretty uh, surprising all in all. Um, I'm going to address really two different topics, one being the discovery of the new generational future in Los Angeles, and then put a spotlight on the issue of the millennials and their struggle for housing. Um, what's going to happen? The aging baby boomers are part of that story as well. It kind of fits together. And they, it's all happening here in Los Angeles, as it is other places, but many of the changes are more dramatic here in LA. I mean, I've stayed in my, here my whole career. Uh, well, not my whole career. I, I was also at the University of Texas, University of Cincinnati, University of Wisconsin, all briefly. Um, Texas was pretty good. Um, but LA's demography is much more exciting. Everything happens here first. It's the capital of immigration. It's the capital of planning and development. Uh, there's a lot happening here in LA to, to keep an eye on. We found these 10 findings from our new study of the generational future of Los Angeles. I'm not going to go through all these. You're welcome to look at this online. I'll give you the website later. These are all big changes that have happened. I'll highlight some of them. And I can group them briefly for you into four broad categories. The first one is what's happening with population growth. It's basically a slowdown that's been sustained. We thought it was a temporary slowdown, but LA has slowed down permanently, it appears. On top of that, we have an immigration turnaround, which contributes to that population slowdown. Uh, whereas immigration was rising, now it's falling, and uh, it's surprising how that is shaping up. Meanwhile, the previous immigrants are still here, they're aging in place, and that has uh, consequences. On top of all that, we have the big generation turnaround. Uh, it's a total transformation. We have a declining number of kids, and we have a soaring senior ratio. All this is happening uh, in the same time period, uh, making our city so different than what we knew before. And then it comes down to a bottom line of a, of a homegrown revolution where the, the great majority of people now are native Californians, whereas before they were always immigrants or refugees from Iowa or Texas or some other state. Now they are of California, and that changes everything, we think. Um, it comes up most obviously when you talk to the voters and the taxpayers. You know, they are very much focused on their own self-interest, and they have these public beliefs about taxation and about the broader California policy narrative, and it's really rooted in these demographic assumptions. They think there's too much growth. They want to beat it away with a stick. They want to put the clamps on. Uh, they think there's too many immigrants, and they think the place is really changing too rapidly, and they think that seniors don't exist, and everybody is a baby boomer like Peter Pan, still age 30. Those are the good old days. For those of you who are under 30, you don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in fact, time happens, and that's actually the greatest uh, advantage I've drawn from looking at, at demography is the idea of time, and the ability to be able to look at how time unfolds you really can't do the future if you can't do time. You must be able to unveil a time path into the future 
and then with um, decisions and, and operations that will create a better future. And if you don't have the time path, you're, it's just science fiction or it's wishful thinking. It's not really grounded. So the demography actually gives you that. Everything in the field is, is based on time. Uh, and so planners can really profit from that. And I've gotten so involved in the future because I'm, I'm a hybrid. I'm both a planner who does the future and a demographer who thinks about how change happens over time, including future projections. So uh, I may have it on steroids more than um, other people, but I, I, I hope to share that with you um, as we go along here. Basically, th the answer to the question here is the, the old trends are not an accurate guide. In fact, they're totally counterproductive. And those of you who've read my uh, article in Boom magazine on the, on the changing narrative of uh, California's future know this story already. Um, but I, I'll tell a different rendition of it uh, this time. So we have a reversal of outlooks. There's the old outlook from 1990. Most people still think that's pretty current. When people talk about the new demographics, they're still thinking 1990 is new. There's more diversity, there's more immigrants, um, and they're just thinking that's what's new, and they're not really watching what's happened over the next uh, 20 years. And so the outlook from 2010 and beyond is considerably different. Back then, growth was booming out of control. And now we have a slow, steady increase. Uh, back then, we had accelerated immigration. And the foreign-born were escalating. It was a new thing. It happened in California first, LA first, and it spread to the rest of the country later. But now we have this diminished immigration. Even when the economy was good, it was diminishing. And then after the recession, it's been worse. We used to have high fertility, all these kids, they're too expensive, we can't afford them. Uh, and now we have this reduced fertility, we're actually losing kids. There's a net loss of kids out of California. And out of LA, in the last decade, we lost 17% of our children under age 10. It's a, it's a radical uh, reversal. Growth used to come from outside the state, now it comes from inside the state. And we don't really realize that we're totally responsible for our future workers now. They're not coming to help us. No one's going to come save us from outside. They're going to be people from, who are already born and living here, probably in second grade right now, or fourth grade. So let's look at, let's look at the data on this. Here's the continued population growth. Um, oh. oh, there. Actual census data. And the growth, this is the growth in a decade. So from the 1950s, you had over um, 1.8 million people added to LA County. That was a whopper decade. Then it slumped off in the, uh, in the 60s, down to only 1 million growth. And in the 70s, down to 400,000 growth. And then something happened after the 70s when we had this big boom, and growth shot back up to 1.4 million in one decade in the 80s. Many people think that's the golden era of migration to LA, to California in that decade. Uh, I've told this story many times about Reagan in the White House fighting off the Russians and putting all this defense spending in Southern California. The aerospace boom really fed the growth in the 80s. Then the Russians were defeated, aerospace spending stopped, and we had our, our worst recession in the 1990s before the, the Great Recession had just occurred. Uh, our recession was so much worse here than everywhere else that growth stopped coming to California um, in the 80s. was the last period, and in the 90s it dropped off and the 2000s, it dropped even lower, down to like you know, 300,000 growth, really paltry growth. And that wasn't what we expected. We thought, according to projections from the State Department of Finance, that there would be a rebound of growth back closer to the 80s than it was in the, in the, um, in the, in the 90s. And that growth did not materialize at all. And so the new projections that came in were much lower. Uh, for growth in, in, in subsequent decades. Let me show you this as a total, as an arc of a total population. And here is, is the census, actual census data. You see that slump there in the 70s where growth really slowed down. Then it resumed. And uh, the old projections are the faded gray line up on top. That's the old, from the state of California. Those are the Department of Finance projections. And then the new projections come underneath it by other people, myself and also the State, State Department of Finance started looking at our numbers and said, uh, we like yours better. And so they made their forecast lower. So what does it mean for growth? Well, growth has slowed down. How much? 
Well, one way I like to tell how slow growth is is to ask, what year will it be when California hits 50 million? Or what year will it be when LA County gets to 12 million? So here's the old expectation. <coughs> we get to 12 million by 2030. The new expectation, after 2060. That's a 30 year slowdown in our growth. That's pretty dramatic. It doesn't make a lot of real estate developers happy necessarily because they'd rather have more people, build more houses, build more apartments, offices, and yet development is proceeding anyway because there's need to keep revamping the old structures and to meet new needs. But it's a, it's a big slowdown and it, it's a different character to the population that's happening as well. So one of the big factors is this immigration slowdown. That, um, that we, it really happened first in California in the 90s during that bad recession. And no one quite realized it was there. We thought it was temporary slowdown, but it, it really hasn't ever revived in, in California. And LA is where the epicenter of this is. So let me show you my calculations on how immigration grew after 1970, where it peaked and where it is today. And so here's the annual immigrant arrivals. This is for the whole US. And you see it surged during the 90s and hit a new peak in 2000 in the US and then dropped off. And now here's California's numbers, peaked earlier, and LA County's numbers. And we've rolled back to about the same level of in-migration now from abroad that we had back in 1975. It's, it's a very much a reversal. It's still growing, but very slowly. And in fact, the total foreign-born numbers have leveled off. We know this because um, of looking at the census data, but also the projections. So John Pickin, uh, my colleague in these projection series, and I have developed this method that has these extra dimensions. They don't use these anywhere else in the country. Because you see, the rest of the country doesn't have any immigrants. They just have age, sex, and race. And if there's any immigrants, they're hidden into the race categories. And of course, if you're African-American immigrant versus African-American native-born, you're really different people. And the same with Latino, and same with Asian. So you would like to know. And so we had this information. I'll share some of this in the presentation right here, um, what the results are. Here's our projection on the foreign born. It's, it's, we projected this first, our first series in 2001. We showed this leveling off uh, in California. And now it's, it's um, we now have it for Los Angeles as well. Los Angeles is leveled at a much higher level. 36% of the residents of LA County are foreign born. Why doesn't it keep going up? Well, the number of, of, of incomers, the, the new immigrants, has really tailed off. And the old immigrants have a way of stabilizing the population share because the immigrants also have kids. And when kids are born here, they become native born. And so the same immigrant families will have immigrant parents and native born kids. And so the population share can't keep going up if people have kids. So we knew it would level off. Uh, but it's, it is still surprising how, how flat it is. It's not going down. We think that everybody's staying in place, but the inflow is not enough to keep it rising anymore. Now, is that, w w does that have any political consequence, do you think? Well, the way we look at it is that people's expectations are all based on the recent past, the recent trend. And so when they look at immigration or immigrants, they think, well, how much is it increasing? And they make statements like you've heard, at this rate, pretty soon, you know, we're all going to be foreign born. <laughs> Not possible, but that's the extrapolation that you would get. And, and every political uh, debate always has that line in it. At this rate, and then they say something outrageous. <laughs> uh, and, but that's what you might have assumed because it did increase dramatically in the 70s and 80s. During that boom period, we, it was uh, remarkable the LA County went from, literally went from 11% uh, foreign born to 33% foreign born really quickly. And at that rate, pretty soon, we're all gonna be foreign born. Uh, well, that was the outlook then. Then it slowed down and the outlook from uh, 2000 uh, was still upward and now our projections are this flat line. Basically what it means is, and what you already know, is that immigration in California is not any kind of issue at all. No one's talking about it. It's not a problem. It's not a concern. It's not a change. It's just a fact of life. We've reached equilibrium. 
And that's a, that's a peaceful place to be compared to, for example, South Carolina, which might have 5% immigrants and it's freaking them out because that's twice as big as it used to be. Uh, it's all relative. And so we are a steady state. We also have a lot more experience, so we know the advantages of immigration. The, the survey data show that people who are most uh, opposed to immigration are living in places where there are no immigrants and have no idea what an immigrant is, mm -hmm. other than what they've heard about in campaign ads, and that, which are obviously cartoons of real people. <laughs> so back in the olden days, you see half of the immigrants were, were newcomers. This, this black shade right here, those are the people who arrived in, less, in the last 10 years. In 1990, it was just over half of all the foreign born had newly arrived. And now, going forward in time, we see that it's been dropping off and will continue to drop off. And the foreign born is still, are still there, but they're longer and longer settled. And I ask you, how are the ones who've been here for 30 years different from those who've been here just um, five years? What's the difference? Assimilated. Assimilated, okay, that's in partly, that might be true. But what do we know for sure? Older. They're older. How many years older? 30 well, 20. 30 years older, okay. Yeah. And people who are 30 years older, and, and my data show that a, a Mexican immigrant who's been here for just five years, you know, barely, t like less than 10% are homeowners. After they've been in California for 30 years, 51% homeowners. No, 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 that's 20 years. 20 years, 51%. 30 years, 60% homeowners. The state average is only 54% homeowners, so they exceed the state average after 30 years. Length of time is a, is a measure of how rooted you are, how uh, far, how much progress you've made in your career, what kind of contacts you've developed, how much savings you've developed, and over time, people progress uh, economically. Uh, and so these ones up here that we see are longer settled, they are, they're largely homeowners and they um, are um, in much more secure position than the newly arrived immigrants that they once were themselves um, 30 years earlier. I can show it to you separately for Latinos and Asians, it's the same dynamic. Basically, the immigration is slowing down and we have more and more of these long settled uh, immigrants and that, that's the mature metropolis that New York used to be when I lived there uh, way back when in the 70s and that Chicago uh, used to be where you had immigrants who had arrived in, in the 20s and now had been residing for 30 or 40 years in those cities and they were you know, long, stable uh, populations. Uh, whereas LA was the frontier where newcomers came and it acted like a frontier town in many ways, as you've read about, I'm sure, in the stories about the police department and other things. It's a cowboy town. Now we're a mature metropolis and everything is much more sophisticated uh, because we have longer experience on, on all sides. So there's been a reversal of outlooks. The old outlook was accelerated immigration, now it's really diminished. There, most immigrants were new arrivals, now they're long settled and older. And the immigrant share was soaring. And we assumed it was unlimited. And now we know that it, it's a constant and it's stable for the future. And so that, that's the, the outlook here, of the new maturity, uh, as we called it um, in one of our reports the new maturity of Los Angeles. Let me just turn to the generation transformation, which is really uh, now what's changing, is what we were not paying any attention to before. There's this declining number of children and rising seniors. Here's just the number of babies born. This is the actual data with some projections by the Department of Finance. And you see that peak over there? I know this is LA County, but it looks like the Matterhorn at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. That peak? That is actually 1990, 1991. That's the peak year for the millennials to be born, by the way, right there. The peak, and the, the peak, uh, the, uh, that's the peak year for millennial birth. How old are millennials today? 25 year olds are the, are the most prompt, predominant uh, age of uh, millennials. And the range goes you know, over, over a 20 year span, but that's the peak. And you see how sharply it went up. If you were expecting what's happening with births in uh, LA County or, or in California, what would you expect would happen in 1985? You see this upswing and you'd be projecting it to the skies and thinking, my God, we can't build enough schools. These people are gonna eat us alive. We can't afford all these people. Close the borders. Well, a lot of these babies were being born by baby boomers 
born in America, people like me. Well, my son's in there. My youngest son was born in Pasadena. And so it was a confluence of the baby boomers having babies, immigrants arriving having babies, and a booming economy it all came together at a climax there in the late 80s. And then we had the recession, and everything just went down. Um, uh, the, ba the boomers got too old to have babies, thank God. <laughs> um, and uh, immigrants started going elsewhere because they're looking for jobs, and jobs weren't in California in 1993. And so we see it drop off. It leveled off, and then it dropped again right before, during the recession year. See, that little drop down into the recession. They now expect it's going to revive a little bit, but uh, never going to get back to the peak that it was. Even though California is a much bigger state, it's never going to uh, return to that old level of, of, of babies being born. So we're not getting the new kids um, you know, in the neighborhoods. Let's look at all the age groups together. You can see this in, in, in perspective, I think, much better. This is uh, the story in the last 20 years, so it's, say from 1990 to 2000. And this is the growth in a decade. Um, in the older years, over 65, do you see much growth? It's not really anything happening. It's not on the radar screen. There's no growth. The green cohorts there are the good guys. Those are the ones that have all the money. Those are the baby boomers. And they have all the money because they're in their late middle age. That's the, the age span when you have your, your peak uh, job promotions. You have your best incomes. And they are um, just a gold mine of, of consumer spending and tax dollars for governments. It was a golden era. The red cohorts back there, the millennials, there was a growth uh, in the teenage years um, when the millennials were that young. And it's still the first wave of millennials wasn't that big. And so the actual population declined in the, in the uh, 25, 29 uh, in those last 20 years. And I, I show you this because most governments, most businesses are geared towards the past. That's what's normal. That's how their budgets are, are, are con conceived, is what's, uh, what to do, what's, what to plan for, what to expect. And here's the next 20 years. The next 20 years, the good guys now cross age 65, get all their entitlements and become the bad guys, mm -hmm. taking all the tax dollars. Same people, they deserve their entitlements. Uh, the millennials now advance, and there's a growth in the young ages, which is a reversal of the sharp decline at young ages in the last 20 years. That last 20 years really hollowed out uh, um, apartment markets, retail, the retail sector, uh, the rental sector just de declined because there was a, a net loss of people to fill up apartments. And we got used to that as normal. Uh, in that decline, uh, immigrant um, families moved into that housing to, uh, to find shelter. And now the millennials have returned and they're, they're growing again and they're m moving into those same um, residences that had been vacated earlier. Uh, but it's a total reversal. And when I look at this, I, I think, gee, every age group has flipped. It's uh, what was going up is now going down. And um, it's hard to comprehend. And that underlies so much of uh, business and, and government. One way I summarize it is with my senior ratio that you, many of you probably heard me talk about. It's just simply the ratio of people 65 and older divided by working age people. And that senior ratio was flat for uh, four decades. So it's not an issue, invisible. And then in the next, well, really just the next 20 years, that ratio goes up by 70%. Uh, and it's not just, it's in every state. Every state in the nation, and, and it goes up in LA uh, County, Orange County. I've got, I got done it for everywhere. It's pretty much the same. Orange County is a little more extreme because it was lower to begin with. But it, you used to have in LA County uh, about 20 um, seniors for every 100 working age, and now that's going to go up to 40 seniors per 100 working age. And so I don't know what difference that really makes, but a lot because. <laughs> What it, what it amounts to is um, everything that seniors do relative to uh, working age people is now suddenly, after 40 years of stability, is <coughs> the, the ship is, is tipping over. We now have uh, way too many uh, people who need senior services, who are going to be retirees, need to be replaced in the workforce, who are looking to sell homes. And when old people sell homes, who do they sell them to? 
younger people. Uh, and that ratio is tipped uh, in a way we're not used to this. It's never happened before in America. Uh, it, it's, it's happened in Japan ahead of us, um, but we don't want to go to where Japan is. Uh, we're, we're benefited because we have immigrants. Japan does not, and so that's helped us to not become as extreme. But um, we really have, th have this uh, reversal here on the generation front, on all, f all, sc all scores, children and elderly, both have reversed from what we had before. Uh, we thought children were the problem, and now we realize that seniors are an issue that we have to uh, cope with. So it's a revolution in outlook. Uh, I call it also the homegrown revolution because along the way here, we're realizing that there's been a change in who is California. Who is it that is California? It used to be everybody in California was from somewhere else, ever since the gold rush that came from somewhere else. But this is a graph here showing, uh, it's a long-standing graph we developed from 1980 for each county and the gray line for the state, what share of the population is native Californian, born in California? I learned that was a big deal when I lived in Texas. If you're a native Texan, you're somebody. And if you're not, you're, you're nobody. And they let you know that, they remind you. Well, so that's important to them, but what, what does it mean for California? Well, it means someone who's born here, it means lots of things. It means we're pretty sure your mother was here too. She had to be. And if your mother's here, your family's here, you're rooted here, your siblings are probably here. And probably it means you had your entire life, you're educated in California schools. It means your high school friends are here. It, it alters your, your rootedness in the community. You've got many more people from way back who can pull on your sleeve and say, hey, how would you like to buy some tickets to my banquet? Remember I bought tickets to your banquet? And so there's a reciprocity that, that uh, it fosters greater philanthropy when you have a more rooted, homegrown population, as opposed to people who came from somewhere else. You just have deeper networks. It's what we have on the East Coast in, in, in Pennsylvania, where nobody ever moves. They're very, very entrenched. Uh, it's what, ha what you see in Cleveland and Ohio. Um, and California is maturing that way now where we have this homegrown population. It also means that we're totally dependent on our own, not sort of hoping to be saved by outsiders, but really dependent on workers that we raised in California schools, that are, that are great schools, with tax dollars that we contributed in a very rich way, not those schools you've heard about that are, not, that are failing. They can't be those schools because we're dependent on these now. Um, but it sets up a bit of a, a recognition or a realization that we need to invest more in our own kids because that's all we have. To make that more than just a, a piece of rhetoric, it's nice to have some demographic data. And so here is a, a, a graph that presents the results from our uh, projections in 2030. What will be the profile? Who will be the residents in Los Angeles? How many of them will be foreign born? How many will be born in other states? Oh, I, I haven't asked that question yet. Show of hands. How many people in this room were not born in California? Not born. See, it's a big deal. Well, you all outdated now. <laughs> You're over here in this gray zone here. That's basically over 65. Over 65, that's all the people who are born in other states. The foreign born are also kind of dated. And you see the majority of people, it's already true today in, in 2015, but looking forward another 15 years, it'll be more obvious that the 50% line is at age 35, 44. At that age, the young workers up to 35, 44, the majority will be native Californians, the product of California schools. And that is a, uh, that's a big change. That's not what we know in California and, uh, and we haven't been acting like this is the case. I can show it to you by, by different race and ethnic groups if you want, just really quickly. That's the pattern among whites. And here it is among blacks. Blacks, a lot of people were other US born. That's from the South. But it's only going to be um, people over 75, um, mostly all California born. Here's Latinos. Uh, under age 35, it's, it's California born. And here's uh, Asians. They're the highest per percent foreign born right now. But among Asians, also the young people, 
California born. So it cuts across all groups, and, and it's, it's just an a indicator of, of a maturation and stability. It was never tracked in California. No one ever looked at this. We didn't discover that we had crossed the magic 50% line until uh, like five years after it happened when we found it in the data. It was an unheralded um, benchmark, but I think it, and it's been picked up by other people as an important political um, um, crossing. Because we're now dependent on our own. It changes outlooks on taxation and policy. So let me turn now to the housing question of the millennials. And are they a solid foundation for the housing market? Uh, we hope they are because we're all dependent on, on the housing market. Everybody lives in a house. Whether you own it or rent it, you live in it. And uh, it's, a, it's a shared resource. I mean, you think you have exclusive rights to it, but it's ultimately a shared resource. Most houses get used by 10 or more people in, the, in a house's lifetime. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a limited stock. We have limited land. And uh, we need to know what's going on about it. This is a national graph from 1910 to 2040. It shows the number of people turning age 25 each year. That's the, the bottom part. And then the top shaded area is the additional number of immigrants who arrive each year. And the sum then is the total number of people who are uh, new in the housing market. And what's important here is there's dips and, and surges and then dips and surges. This number one here was back in the 1950s when a number of uh, young people went negative and immigration was near zero. And that was a very uh, uh, bad period in the housing market when it led to hollowing out cities. They called it gray areas in New York. Uh, we thought they're going to the suburbs for better housing, yes, but there was no replacements to fill the, the apartments when they left. Then there was a turnaround, number two here, when the baby boom came of age. In 1970, the baby boomers are crossing age 20 and 25. And for a long period here, for 20 years, the number of uh, young people kept rising. And that was the beginning of the affordability crisis, the beginning of the long housing boom that we think is normal. It was, but it was being fed by this age ripple that was uh, crossing age 25. Then in phase three here, we had a downturn in the 1990s when the last of the boomers had crossed age 25, and then we had Generation X arrive, a runty, undersized cohort, <laughs> uh, a good 30% smaller than the ones that had preceded it, and it represents a deep hole in the housing market now because they, there's just not enough of them to fill the vacancies that you need to step into. And so that really, when they reached age 25, it killed all apartment construction. Apartments uh, in, in California, or it's, the story is extraordinary there. Uh, we learned this partly uh, through some work with uh, SCAG. Um, Joe Carreras and Frank Wynn figured this out and taught me this point, just how crucial it is that apartment construction depends on having lots of 25-year-olds. If 25-year-olds are shrinking, no developer is going to build apartments. It's just, it's just the market isn't there because they occupy so much. Do you know... What percent of all construction in California used to be in apartments way back in the good old days of the 1960s or the 70s? Way back then, 48% of all construction was apartments back then. Then comes the 1990s and we get concerned about affordability. We're concerned about urban sprawl. We're concerned about the environment. And you think we want to have denser housing it's cheaper, more affordable. Why don't we have denser housing? What percentage of housing in the 1990s do you suppose was in apartments? It used to be 48% for three decades in a row, 60s, 70s, 80s, 48%. And in the 90s, 23%. So less than half the share of before. The explanation really being that downturn in number of young people. But now the millennials have arrived. And the millennials turn it around again. And they started to arrive around 2005 uh, in the suitable age for apartments on their own. And that turnaround started an apartment revival that was cut short by the um, Great Recession. 
and then was revived in the aftermath. And the hottest thing going now is apartments. Uh, vaunted single family home builders like Lennar Corporation are making most of their profits now off of apartment buildings. They've seen the light and uh, they saw this graph, of course, and they realized we should invest in apartments. I'm going to go down and talk to them about that. Um, but I think it's, uh, anybody who looked at the numbers could tell that this is a, a big factor. Going forward here, phase four, we're not sure wh what happens exactly next. Uh, but there is an re urban revival, and it's being fed in part by that surge of young people that reverses the former decline. But as you know, other things have been going on at the same time. The Great Recession has messed up a lot of stuff. Not just the recession, but the boom, the bubble in housing before the recession, then the bust. It's been a roller coaster. This is the homeownership rate in uh, California on top, and then LA County on the bottom. They follow the same uh, basic pattern um, with this blip upward in the boom period and then a steep downturn. Do you think that downturn is going to continue for another year? Our, our data, you know, are lagged behind reality. We're going to get the 2014 data uh, in uh, two weeks. And we're going to see has the red line pulled out of its decline? Is it leveling off? Or maybe, you see the blue line starting to level off? See it? See it? <laughs> Any glimmer of hope, please. <laughs> it's, it's not as steep. So I like to see that blue line definitely begin to come up. And the red line, too, if possible. We'll know that in two weeks. That'll be the 2014 data. So it's, uh, it's, it's not this year. It's, it's data from last year, but it'd be really nice to see that. I tried to postpone this talk for another two weeks, but I, I, I couldn't wait to give the talk, so I, you can look at the data or stay, stay tuned. Simon Choi back here, he'll get the data. You can email us all. It's going to be one thing to look at. Is the homeownership rate please coming up or is it still in decline? And uh, why that's so is uh, it's, it's not just everybody altogether. You know, old people don't really count in this calculation. What counts is young people who are of home buying age. So I want to show you three different age groups. I'm going to start you with 35 to 44 year olds. They are the, right now they are the generation X that's underpopulated. And we'll look at them first. And I, I have data for California and for LA. I think this is the California data here. And I'm going to calculate it based on um, how big was the population in 2000. And so here's the population data relative to 2000, and it's down. Uh, California, in this age group, is down uh, to about, what does that say, 92% of what it used to be. Okay, that's the population. Let's do the same thing for the households, the number of occupied housing units led by this group. How are they doing? Oh, a little bit worse. Well, how about homeowners? Let's see how the homeowners in this group are doing. But not so hot. They actually perked up above the, the, the 2000 level during the bubble and then they, they just cratered. So here it is for LA County. Uh, our population numbers are a little bit lower. <coughs> We've our population has slumped in this age group, 20, 35, 44. And you see that the um, households have slumped even more. So the housing uh, demand dropped even more and then the homeownership dropped even more. But that's Generation X. That's water over the dam. What's really more interesting and more important is the millennials. Because the millennials are 35% bigger than uh, Generation X, and they are the great hope that they're going to come of age now. The recession chains have been cut away. They're going to be freed up to do what they want to do. One of the big questions is, do the millennials want to live in apartments, two-bedroom apartments with roommates, when they're 44 years old? Do they want to ever get married or ever find a partner? And what about kids? Forget about kids. Most uh, expectations now are that the millennials are going to track like Generation X. Follow them, hopefully not into the deep hole that, that Generation X fell into. Let's see. Here's the data for uh, age 35, 44, which is where the millennials are today. And you see that California, the population has spiked upward. 
Uh, LA County, it dipped, but it's now recovering. Its ri population is rising there also. Households, homeowners are lagging way behind where they used to be for that age group. We really need to see more uptick than that. Uh, I see it is bottoming out right here. And I would anticipate that the data in two weeks will show an upturn, finally, in the number of homeowners among this age group. But we'll, um, it's already upturned in California already. So LA County is surely this year, we hope to see that. Here's the next age group, 15 to 24, which is really too young to be of consequence, but they will be in five years more. And you see their numbers are really high in, in California compared to what they used to be in back in 2000. And here is in LA County also, it's way up, but a huge gap between their population as a share of what it used to be and the number of households they occupy compared to what it used to be. A tremendous gap that needs to be closed. Now, if, if it's not closed, I mean, it's, it's their own preferences. They can decide, but hopefully they have the economic capacity to do what they want to do. And we, we suspect that they have been held back by the recession. And it's the money that's holding them back, not their preferences. For whatever reason, if the millennials don't step into their role in the housing market, it weakens it for everybody who's above them. Because we're all counting on handing down our houses to millennials. Without the millennials to hand it down to, the bottom falls out of the market, literally from the bottom. The bottom drops out. So it's of extreme importance. There's a lot of cohort momentum underway. Uh, I have one graph that shows this pretty well, looking at the number of homeowners each age and tracking them 10 years to see whether the number of homeowners goes up or goes down as people get 10 years older. Here's the California numbers. The red cohorts at the top are the baby boomers. They are the largest, this is the number of homeowners. So this is the largest two cohorts. So they occupy the most homes. Half of all the homes owned in California are owned by baby boomers. And you see the trajectories upward at young ages as people got older. The boomers now are at the top of, the, of their life cycle in housing. And after that age, cohorts start to shrink their home ownership because they sell off and move to Arizona, because they, they decide to downsize and, and rent, or eventually down here they die. And it's a, it's a housing life cycle. But right now the boomers are at the very peak of that. Here is LA County, it's the same dynamic, but you see the boomers are just sitting there so far above everybody else. So many more of them. And that's what's uh, concerning. As they trade down, who are they going to sell to? Who's going to actually move into their houses? Are they going to sell to investors from China? Are they going to sell to Chinese who are going to live here? Are there that many Chinese who are going to live here? Who are, are they going to sell to their kids? Are there enough baby boomers kids? Are the millennials going to step up? Who's going to buy these houses? And you know, the gaps that you see between the cohorts um, are worrisome gaps. There's, there's, there's a not, they're not touching each other. There's, there's a shortfall coming from below. And so we really need, it really is an urgency to get the um, nation's housing finance system functioning in a way it makes it easier. So it's not a barrier to people buying houses if that's what they want. Uh, it's, a, it's a moment when interest rates are low and it would be, it would be a, a great time to buy a property if you could qualify for a mortgage. Yo Jung Lee and I have done some projections that Lincoln Institute is supposed to be publishing, uh, I think this month. Uh, can't be because I have not seen the galley proofs yet. Next month. It's been delayed by six months now. This is what we think is the trajectories into homeownership of the baby boomers, the black line on the top, and then millennials. For the millennials, we have four different scenarios. We're not sure which of these it might be, but they're all lower than what the baby boomers achieved in their own careers. Uh, scenario one is surely not going to happen. Uh, that's a doomsday scenario. Um, but it looks like 
two or three are the most likely outcomes, and their homeownership rate would be end up ultimately as much as 20 percentage points lower than what the boomers achieve at the same age. Why is this all so? Um, there's some kind of eroded po market power of the millennials. And I tried to just diagram this uh, conceptually because there's a series of different um, steps. O on the face of it, he here's just a comparison to Generation X. And you see how the millennials are bigger. And so the, you would expect the millennials to have more uh, uh, presence in the housing market. This is the index that's set to 100 as being uh, normal, normal being Generation X. So the millennials should have a bigger impact because they're, they're bigger, except that they're also more diverse. And um, minority groups have, on, a, on average, lower home ownership rates than, than non-Hispanic whites. And when you average it all out, it brings down the, the possibility a little bit lower if the disparities continue the way they have in the past. Incomes also have fallen since 2000 because of the recession and its aftermath. And so that brings down market power more. And then on top of that, we're researching this right now, but parents' wealth has also changed. So millennials don't really buy houses just on their own. They, many times they get assistance from their families. And the assistance uh, is dependent on how much wealth their families have. Uh, and it's the families took a beating during the recession. Uh, house, their, their house values fell, their stock holdings fell. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a big disparity between non-Hispanic white parents and um, other minority parents. The white parents have uh, average wealth of like 340,000, and minority parents on average have wealth of 40,000. 340 versus 40. So half of the millennials are, are, are children of color, half of them. So half of them have parents of color, and if their average wealth is 40,000, there's not a lot of assistance that can come that way, whereas the white kids might be better off, but it's only half of the millennials. So there's many different factors working here to undermine their, their housing demand, and it seems like um, if, if government policy was to depend on family support as the only way to make housing happen, you'd be cutting out half of the, of the young people so we need all the young people, not half of them. And so it needs to be some uh, new um, support system to help people buy homes uh, at an affordable um, price under terms that they can qualify for. And the last uh, criteria here is credit, which is very hard to measure. There's a couple of different ways that we found to do it. And once you factor in the, the access to credit, it knocks the millennials' market power down to 46% or even 23% of what was expected. So everything is working against the millennials, every step along the way. And we need them more than ever, not less than ever. So that's, that's the problem. So here's the question. I come to my conclusion. So how fast are we getting back to normal now? I mean, is this the new normal already? Are we there yet? I hope not. Um, you know, and maybe there'll be a period of super normal as we catch up, because there really is a lot of deferred um, housing advances that it, it, it just been put off. All these people living in their parents' basements have got to come out. <laughs> All these people doubled up with roommates in two bedroom apartments. Maybe they've had enough. Maybe they really want to get a yard so they can finally get that dog, <laughs> and not that little thing. <laughs> but a big dog. Or maybe they, people want to you know, move forward with their lives, and they've been on hold because of the recession. So really, what can we do to get millennials back on track? And the importance I keep emphasizing as a planner is it's not just charity for the sake of the millennials. We're all tied together here. The millennials' fate really determines what happens to the uh, baby boomers. And baby boomers are the, are the big gorillas who have all the voting power so hey, wake up, um, boomers, and uh, listen up. Speaking of which, the Sacramento Bee produced this great cartoon. I, I ran an op-ed there a couple of years ago. I know no one saw it, because it came out in the middle of July. Uh, and 
everybody was away on vacation. But here's this beautiful picture of the subdivision of the American dream, a, a subdivision of houses floating in the sky, young millennials climbing the ladder, striving to reach the clouds, and they can't quite get there. Uh, I, I put my own headline on this story. Here, here's my headline. I mean, well, first let me tell you, what, what are the people up in the, in, the, in the houses in the sky, what are they saying? They're looking down, clucking their tongues. Oh, it's too bad, Sonny. You should have come sooner. It was easy before. You didn't try hard enough. Yeah, right. The old folks, they need the young folks to make it. Oh, they're not selling their houses. So we really are tied to it, in it together. The voters, the taxpayers have a lot at stake with the, with the fate of the millennials, and we're not taking it seriously enough. A lot of things come together here in, in this talk. So we have the, the homegrown revolution that we're now dependent on the children of California. We have fewer children than we used to have, not enough to go around, way too many seniors. Uh, and you know that if you invest in the kids, they will grow up. That's a demogra demographic fact. In 20 years, they will be 20 years older, and they will be the new workers and new taxpayers, and possibly even maybe the new home buyers. And the way I think the social contract works in, uh, in the real world, all around the world, except not in California, is that people stay in the same area, and they take turns as they rotate through this life cycle. The young people grow up, and then they get to become mature adults in middle age with in the prime earners, the prime taxpayers. And they're supposed to be paying the most tax dollars in this age range. Not complaining about it. That's your duty in this age range. And then you get to graduate and become a senior, and you get all your benefits. You rotate positions, you take turns. That's, this is a basic fact of planning, I think. Or is it policy? Or is it just humanity? I'm not sure what it is, but it's, uh, we've lost track of this in California. But that's how the system's supposed to work. And if you do that, we're going to arrive at this answer. So what is the new normal? And can we, what can we really expect from the millennials? How can we make it better? What will be the new normal? It's really up to us to figure it out. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this in conversation, what we know about the housing market in Los Angeles, which is that there's a severe shortage, and so there's this gap for affordability, and there's also this trend of displacement, um, especially for immigrant communities and low-income communities of color. So I just wanted to see what data there is about that and what we can do to, to reverse that trend. That's a pretty big package you just gave me there. <laughs> uh, we're in a deep hole. Uh, we've been in a hole ever since the 1990s, or even earlier. But there's a shortage of apartments. It's been built up over decades. A, a, absent, a, a lack of construction, decade, year after year, adds up after a decade and two decades. And now it's really hitting us hard. Because now the millennials have arrived and they want apartments and we didn't build any. Well, we built some, but we built half the, less than half of what we needed to build. And how do you solve that in one year? You, you can't. You're, you, it's going to take a decade or more to dig out of the hole. And people want answers today. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm on record as actually supporting luxury apartments. I basically say, build all luxury apartments. Go ahead. Build, as long as you build a lot of housing, it won't stay luxury forever. It's gonna, it's, it, other people will get it. There's a shortage of housing, and what's happened is that that's what's making people then creep out into the neighborhoods and occupy working class housing that was formerly held by uh, Latino families because they haven't got any apartments of their own. So you need to build apartments. I, I like what USC is doing, building apartments on campus, pulling the students back in closer to campus and out of the neighborhoods. The shortage of housing is, is our problem. And it's built up, the problem has grown since 1990, and we can't unwind it very quickly. It's a real problem. So the fastest way to get housing built is to let developers build uh, market rate housing uh, that's luxury, provided that it does not displace existing low-income residents. 
if it does displace existing residents, then they need to um, provide an equal number of replacement apartments on that site or, or related to that site. So I would like to see more working class housing built, but if, let's start with any kind of housing, any kind. Um, I also think that um, we're doing a study now, we, we're working, me and Gary Painter, um, that some of the problem is that all these uh, people who are supposed to be buying houses have been diverted into uh, apartments. There's six million should have been homeowners who are now in apartments. And they are then occupying housing that should have been occupied by other people who are supposed to be in apartments. And so there's been a, a, a bumping down effect so that some people are squeezed out of the housing market entirely. There's not enough housing to go around. So if you could get people moving back into homeownership, you'd free up some of the demand in apartments. And if you could build more apartments, that would provide more supply. And if you do this as fast as you can, it's still going to take a decade uh, to get things anywhere near normal. It, it's, a, it's a deep problem. And I blame myself in part for not being successful in convincing people 15 years ago, when I first started talking about this, like in 2000 about, that we have a shortage of apartments and we need to build because the millennials are coming. How did I know the millennials were coming? They were five years old or 10 years old and do the arithmetic. You could tell they're here, there's a lot of them, and they're gonna hit the apartment market and you're not gonna be ready. And everybody said, eh, we'll deal with it when it, when it happens. The trouble is you can't deal with it when it happens because it takes more than one year to build all that housing. And the, the inability to convince people to have any kind of foresight is my deepest frustration. It's, you can't get a committee decision about the future. They can't think past plans for dinner. <laughs> or at the best, the next election. They can't. It's, it's a deep frustration. If anybody has another system, how to get people to realistically think ahead, about something that you're guaranteed is going to happen. We're guaranteed the kids are gonna grow up. We're guaranteed they're not gonna stay in my bedroom. You know, and they're gonna be out of the house. And where are they gonna go? And so the, the middle class is finding housing okay. It's the, it's the working class that is gonna be squeezed out, it looks like. Um, so my question is about um, multi-generational households and the fact that that's not been the tradition here in the United States. It is in a lot of other countries, and also among immigrant communities. It's not necessarily a negative thing. Do you, is there any data regarding that that is sort of useful in terms of um, projecting out the types of housing that might be, because like I'm a Gen Xer. I'm the, the rentee group here. I have parents who are going to, at some point, probably live with me, I think. And I also have children, so I'm just, to me, I, I think about, in terms of where I'm going to live in the future, as probably being a multi-unit or a very large house or something. So I'm just wondering if that's being addressed. Um, because it is very expensive, for example, to have this many households, especially in coastal California. And people are kind of clumping together, I think. In, I don't know. It seems, anecdotally, it seems like they are. But that well, well, during the recession, there was a, a lot more of that. but. The main source of the, the multi-generational housing is coming from Asian families. And developers are very much focused on them because they have enough money to, to pay for new construction. And uh, they believe in having their, their elders live with them. And also the, the Asian young people will live at home as well. Latinos also have, have a, a similar uh, um, pattern, but it's not, doesn't, not so strong on the um, it's common to have the elders live with the family. Uh, the, the kids will live at home. So there is some effort to build um, a housing that has you know, dual master suites and it has a, a mother-in-law quarters. But I think more often the examples I know are people who retrofit existing housing and they have, a, they have a, an apartment for um, the mother-in-law or the kids are in the basement. And it, we're definitely going to be moving that direction more and more. And it, with or without uh, government support, uh, I think that's, um, it's not clear how to support it by the government. You could have the, you could pass a, a accessory apartment ordinance and, and to allow people to build uh, uh, extra units in their backyard. Um, most of those will not be occupied by mother-in-laws. They'll be occupied by some tenant that's providing income to pay for the mortgage. 
Um, we need all solutions. And so that, that's one that will, I think, that is, it solves a couple problems, right? It helps to deal with the, the elder care problem. And it, uh, it, it, it uh, well, it's a, it's a solution that's growing. And it's growing more on the ethnic front than it is uh, elsewhere. But I think it's a, it's a model that's gonna, could be adopted across all ethnic groups. It will, is being adopted across all ethnic groups. So thanks for your presentation, it was really interesting. I'm just uh, curious, the, what are some of the causes of the um, diminishing growth in immigration? Oh, why is it slowing down? Yeah. Uh, Mexico's economy is getting better. Well, it starts slowing down uh, in 2000 in the U.S. You, I, I don't know how to answer that. I always have a problem. Um, basically, immigration f throughout history has always boomed and busted. It's never been a continuous trend. And so it goes up and down with the economy. And uh, the U.S. economy was making fewer jobs in the 2000s. Even during the boom period, the, the job growth was kind of slow. Uh, then once construction slowed down, that cut out a lot of jobs where Mexican workers would, um, were focused. Meanwhile, back in Mexico itself, the birth rate's been so low, they don't have any extra people to give us. We're building a fence, you realize, and there's nobody there to come. Uh, their birth rate used to be 6.8 babies per woman in 1970. 6.8 babies, that's a surplus of babies. So let's do the math, that's 1970. They, they, they come of age in 1990. And so we had a lot of immigration in, in the 90s. Well, now the birth rate's down to 2.2, which is break even, and their, their own economy can absorb all those workers. So then they're coming from further south in, in Central America. Well, or from China, I mean, further away. Uh, immigration is, is just the pool of available immigrants is not as big, and the number of jobs available is not great either. And they, if, it, if there's no job growth, they won't come. So that's the main reason it slowed down. Now, the economy has been responding very slowly now. It's still not enough of a signal to say, yeah, lots of jobs, come here. Um, that's the main reason it slowed down. Now, there's also a fence that's been built. It's, been, it's more difficult to immigrate. That slowed people down some. But really, it's the job uh, slowdown. It's a big factor.